This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Silas Marner, The Weaver of Ravelow, by George Eliot. Chapter 10 just as Malam was naturally regarded in Tarley and Ravelow as a man of capacious mind, seeing that he could draw much wider conclusions without evidence than could be expected of his neighbours who were not on the commission of the peace, such a man was not likely to neglect the clue of the tinder-box, and an inquiry was set on foot concerning a peddler, name unknown, with curly black hair and a foreign complexion, carrying a box of cutlery and jewellery, and wearing large rings in his ears, but either because inquiry was too slow-footed to overtake him, or because the description applied to so many peddlers that inquiry did not know how to choose among them, weeks passed away, and there was no other result concerning the robbery than a gradual cessation of the excitement it had caused in Ravelow. Dunstan Cass's absence was hardly a subject of remark. He had once before had a quarrel with his father, and had gone off, nobody knew whither, to return at the end of six weeks, take up his old quarters unforbidden, and swagger as usual. His own family, who equally expected this issue, with the sole difference that the squire was determined this time to forbid him the old quarters, never mentioned his absence, and when his uncle Kimball or Mr. Osgood noticed it, the story of his having killed Wildfire, and committed some offence against his father, was enough to prevent surprise. To connect the fact of Dunsey's disappearance with that of the robbery occurring on the same day lay quite away from the track of every one's thought, even Godfrey's, who had better reason than any one else to know what his brother was capable of. He remembered no mention of the weaver between them since the time, twelve years ago, when it was their boyish sport to deride him, and besides, his imagination constantly created an alibi for Dunstan. He saw him continually in some congenial haunt, to which he had walked off on leaving Wildfire, saw him sponging on chance acquaintances, and meditating a return home to the old amusement of tormenting his elder brother. Even if any brain in Ravelow had put the said two facts together, I doubt whether a combination so injurious to the prescriptive respectability of a family with a mural monument and venerable tankards would not have been suppressed as of unsound tendency. But Christmas puddings, brawn, and abundance of spirituous liquors, throwing the mental originality into the channel of nightmare, are great preservatives against a dangerous spontaneity of waking thought. When the robbery was talked of at the Rainbow and elsewhere, in good company, the balance continued to waver between the rational explanation founded on the tinder-box, and the theory of an impenetrable mystery that mocked investigation. The advocates of the tinder-box and peddler view considered the other side a muddle-headed and credulous set, who, because they themselves were wall-eyed, supposed everybody else to have the same blank outlook, and the adherents of the inexplicable more than hinted that their antagonists were animals inclined to crow before they had found any corn, mere skimming-dishes in point of depth, whose clear-sightedness consisted in supposing there was nothing behind a barn-door because they couldn't see through it, so that, Though their controversy did not serve to elicit the fact concerning the robbery, it elicited some true opinions of collateral importance. But, while poor Silas's loss served thus to brush the slow current of Ravelow conversation, Silas himself was feeling the withering desolation of that bereavement about which his neighbours were arguing at their ease. To any one who had observed him before he lost his gold, it might have seemed that so withered and shrunken a life as his could hardly be susceptible of a bruise, could hardly endure any subtraction but such as would put an end to it altogether. But, in reality, it had been an eager life, filled with immediate purpose, which fenced him in from the wide, cheerless unknown. It had been a clinging life, and though the object round which its fibres had clung was a dead, disrupted thing, it satisfied the need for clinging. But now the fence was broken down, the support was snatched away. Marner's thoughts could no longer move in their old round, and were baffled by a blank like that which meets a plodding ant when the earth has broken away on its homeward path. The loom was there, and the weaving, and the growing pattern in the cloth, but the bright treasure in the hole under his feet was gone, 
the prospect of handling and counting it was gone the evening had no phantasm of delight to still the poor soul's craving the thought of the money he would get by his actual work could bring no joy for its meagre image was only a fresh reminder of his loss and hope was too heavily crushed by the sudden blow for his imagination to dwell on the growth of a new hoard from that small beginning he filled up the blank with grief as he sat weaving he every now and then moaned low like one in pain it was the sign that his thoughts had come round again to the sudden chasm to the empty evening time and all the evening as he sat in his loneliness by his dull fire he leaned his elbows on his knees and clasped his head with his hands and moaned very low not as one who seeks to be heard and yet he was not utterly forsaken in his trouble the repulsion marner had always created in his neighbours was partly dissipated by the new light in which this misfortune had shown him instead of a man who had more cunning than honest folks could come by and what was worse had not the inclination to use that cunning in a neighbourly way it was now apparent that silas had not cunning enough to keep his own he was generally spoken of as a poor mushed creeter and that avoidance of his neighbours which had before been referred to his ill-will and to a probable addiction to worse company was now considered mere craziness this change to a kindlier feeling was shown in various ways the odour of christmas cooking being on the wind it was the season when superfluous pork and black puddings are suggestive of charity in well-to-do families and silas's misfortune had brought him uppermost in the memory of housekeepers like mrs osgood mr crackenthorpe too while he admonished silas that his money had probably been taken from him because he thought too much of it and never came to church enforced the doctrine by a present of pig's potatoes well calculated to dissipate unfounded prejudices against the clerical character neighbours who had nothing but verbal consolation to give showed a disposition not only to greet silas and discuss his misfortune at some length when they encountered him in the village but also to take the trouble of calling at his cottage and getting him to repeat all the details on the very spot and then they would try to cheer him by saying well master marner you're no worse off nor other poor folks after all and if you was to be crippled the parish should give you allowance i suppose one reason why we are seldom able to comfort our neighbours with our words is that our good-will gets adulterated in spite of ourselves before it can pass our lips we can send black puddings and potatoes without giving them a flavour of our own egoism but language is a stream that is almost sure to smack of a mingled soil there was a fair proportion of kindness in Ravelo, but it was often of a beery and bungling sort and took the shape least allied to the complimentary and hypocritical mr macy for example coming one evening expressly to let silas know that recent events had given him the advantage of standing more favourably in the opinion of a man whose judgment was not formed lightly opened the conversation by saying as soon as he had seated himself and adjusted his thumbs come master marner why you've no call to sit a moaning you're a deal better off to a lost your money nor to a kept it by by foul means i used to think when you first come into these parts as you were no better nor you should be you were younger a deal than what you are now but you were always a staring white-faced creature partly like a bald-faced calf as i may say but there's no knowing it isn't every queer looks thing as old harry's had the making of i mean speaking o toads and such for they're often harmless like and useful against varmin and it's pretty much the same with you as fur as i can see though as to the yarbs and stuff to cure the breathing if you brought that sort o knowledge from distant parts you might a been a bit freer of it and if the knowledge wasn't well come by well you might a made up for it by coming to church regular for as the children as the wise woman charmed i've been at the christening of em again and again and they took the water just as well and that's reasonable for if old harry's got a mind to do a bit of kindness for a holiday like who's got anything against it that's my thinking and i've been clerk o' this parish forty year and i know when the parson and me does the cussing of an ash wednesday there's no cussing of folks as have a mind to be cured without a doctor let kimble say what he will and so master marner as i was saying for there's windings o things as they may carry you to the fur end o the prayer book afore you get back to em my advice is as you keep up your spirits for as for thinking you're a deep un and ha got more inside you nor'll bear daylight 
I'm not of that opinion at all, and so I tell the neighbors. For, says I, you talk o' Master Marner making out a tale. Why, it's nonsense, that is. It'd take a cute man to make a tale like that. And, says I, he looked as scared as a rabbit. During this discursive address, Silas had continued motionless in his previous attitude, leaning his elbows on his knees and pressing his hands against his head. Mr. Macy, not doubting that he had been listened to, paused in the expectation of some appreciatory reply, but Marner remained silent. He had a sense that the old man meant to be good-natured and neighborly, but the kindness fell on him as sunshine falls on the wretched. He had no heart to taste it, and felt that it was very far off him. "'Come, Master Marner, have you got nothing to say to that?' said Mr. Macy at last, with a slight accent of impatience. "'Oh,' said Marner, slowly, shaking his head between his hands, "'I thank you. Thank you. Kindly.' "'Ay, ay, to be sure, I thought you would,' said Mr. Macy. "'And my advice is, have you got a Sunday suit?' "'No,' said Marner. "'I doubted it was so,' said Mr. Macy. "'Now, let me advise you to get a Sunday suit. "'There's Tookie. He's a poor creature, but he's got my tailoring business, "'and some of my money in it, and he shall make a suit at a low price, "'and give you trust, and then you can come to church, and be a bit neighborly.' "'Why, you've never heard me say amen since you come into these parts, "'and I recommend you to lose no time, "'for it'll be poor work when Tookie has it all to himself, "'for I mayn't be equal to stand at the desk at all come another winter.' "'Here Mr. Macy paused, perhaps expecting some sign of emotion in his hearer, "'but not observing any, he went on. "'And as for the money for the suit to close, "'why, you get a matter of a pound a week at your weaving, Master Marner.' "'And you're a young man, eh, for all you look so mushed? "'Why, you couldn't have been five-and-twenty when you come into these parts, eh?' "'Silas started a little at the change to a questioning tone, and answered mildly, "'I don't know. I can't rightly say. It's a long while since.' After receiving such an answer as this, it is not surprising that Mr. Macy observed, later on in the evening at the Rainbow, that Marner's head was all of a muddle, and that it was to be doubted if he ever knew when Sunday came round, which showed him a worse heathen than many a dog. Another of Silas's comforters, besides Mr. Macy, came to him with a mind highly charged on the same topic. This was Mrs. Winthrop, the wheelwright's wife. The inhabitants of Ravelo were not severely regular in their church-going, and perhaps there was hardly a person in the parish who could not have held that to go to church every Sunday in the calendar would have shown a greedy desire to stand well with heaven, and get an undue advantage over their neighbours, a wish to be better than the common run that would have implied a reflection on those who had had godfathers and godmothers as well as themselves, and had an equal right to the burying service. At the same time, it was understood to be requisite for all who were not household servants, or young men, to take the sacrament at one of the great festivals. Squire Cass himself took it on Christmas Day, while those who were held to be good livers went to church with greater, though still with moderate frequency. Mrs. Winthrop was one of these. She was in all respects a woman of scrupulous conscience, so eager for duties that life seemed to offer them too scantily unless she rose at half-past four, though this threw a scarcity of work over the more advanced hours of the morning, which it was a constant problem with her to remove. Yet she had not the vixenish temper which is sometimes supposed to be a necessary condition of such habits. She was a very mild, patient woman, whose nature it was to seek out all the sadder and more serious elements of life, and pasture her mind upon them. She was the person always first thought of in Ravelo when there was illness or death in a family, when leeches were to be applied, or there was a sudden disappointment in a monthly nurse. She was a comfortable woman, good-looking, fresh-complexioned, having her lips always slightly screwed, as if she felt herself in a sick-room with the doctor or the clergyman present. But she was never whimpering, no one had seen her shed tears. She was simply grave, and inclined to shake her head and sigh, almost imperceptibly, like a funereal mourner who is not a relation. It seemed surprising that Ben Winthrop, who loved his quart-pot and his joke, got along so well with Dolly, but she took her husband's jokes and joviality as patiently as everything else, considering that men would be so, 
and viewing the stronger sex in the light of animals whom it had pleased heaven to make naturally troublesome like bulls and turkey-cocks. This good wholesome woman could hardly fail to have her mind drawn strongly towards Silas Marner, now that he appeared in the light of a sufferer, and one Sunday afternoon she took her little boy Aaron with her, and went to call on Silas, carrying in her hand some small lard cakes, flat paste-like articles, much esteemed in Ravelow. Aaron, an apple-cheeked youngster of seven, with a clean starched frill which looked like a plate for the apples, needed all his adventurous curiosity to embolden him against the possibility that the big-eyed weaver might do him some bodily injury, and his dubiety was much increased when, on arriving at the stone-pits, they heard the mysterious sound of the loom. "'Ah, it is as I thought,' said Mrs. Winthrop, sadly. They had to knock loudly before Silas heard them, but when he did come to the door he showed no impatience, as he would once have done, at a visit that had been unasked for and unexpected. Formerly his heart had been as a locked casket with its treasure inside, but now the casket was empty, and the lock was broken. Left groping in darkness with his prop utterly gone, Silas had inevitably a sense, though a dull and half-despairing one, that if any help came to him it must come from without and there was a slight stirring of expectation at the sight of his fellow-men, a faint consciousness of dependence on their good will. He opened the door wide to admit Dolly, but without otherwise returning her greeting than by moving the armchair a few inches as a sign that she was to sit down in it. Dolly, as soon as she was seated, removed the white cloth that covered her lard cakes, and said in her gravest way, "'I'd a baking yesterday, Master Marner, and the lard cakes turned out better nor common, and I'd a ask you to accept some, if you'd thought well. I don't eat such things myself, for a bit of bread's what I like from one year's end to the other, but men's stomachs are made so comical, they want a change. They do, I know, God help em. Dolly sighed gently as she held out the cakes to Silas, who thanked her kindly, and looked very close at them, absently, being accustomed to look so at everything he took into his hand, eyed all the while by the wondering bright orbs of the small Aaron, who had made an outwork of his mother's chair, and was peeping round from behind it. "'There's letters pricked on em,' said Dolly. "'I can't read em myself, and there's nobody, not Mr. Macy himself, rightly knows what they mean, but they've a good meaning, for they're the same as is on the pulpit-cloth at church. What are they, Aaron, my dear?' Aaron retreated completely behind his outwork. "'Oh, go, that's naughty,' said his mother, mildly. "'Well, whatever the letters are, they've a good meaning, and it's a stamp as has been in our house, Ben says, ever since he was a little un, and his mother used to put it on the cakes, and I've always put it on, too, for if there's any good, we've need of it in this world.' "'It's I.H.S.' said Silas, at which proof of learning Aaron peeped round the chair again. "'Well, to be sure, you can read em off,' said Dolly. "'Ben's read em to me the many and many a time, but they slip out of my mind again, the more's the pity, for they're good letters, else they wouldn't be in the church. And so I prick em on all the loaves and all the cakes, though sometimes they won't hold because of the rising. For, as I said, if there's any good to be got, we've need of it in this world, that we have. And I hope they'll bring good to you, Master Marner, for it's with that will I brought you the cakes.' and you see the letters have held better nor common. Silas was as unable to interpret the letters as Dolly, but there was no possibility of misunderstanding the desire to give comfort that made itself heard in her quiet tones. He said, with more feeling than before, "'Thank you. Thank you kindly.' But he laid down the cakes and seated himself absently, drearily unconscious of any distinct benefit towards which the cakes and the letters, or even Dolly's kindness, could tend for him. "'Ah, oh, if there's good anywhere, we've need of it,' repeated Dolly, who did not lightly forsake a serviceable phrase. She looked at Silas pityingly as she went on. "'But you didn't hear the church bells this morning, Master Marner. I doubt you didn't know it was Sunday. Living so lone here, you lose your count, I dare say. And then, when your loom makes a noise, you can't hear the bells. More particular now the frost kills the sound.' "'Yes, I did.' "'I heard em, said Silas, to whom Sunday bells were a mere accident of the day, and not part of its sacredness. There had been no bells in Lantern Yard. "'Dear heart,' said Dolly, pausing before she spoke again, 
"'But what a pity it is you should work of a Sunday, and not clean yourself. "'If you didn't go to church, for if you'd a roasting bit, "'it might be as you couldn't leave it, being a lone man. "'But there's the bakehouse. "'If you could make up your mind to spend a twopence on the oven now and then, "'not every week, of course. "'I shouldn't like to do that myself. "'You might carry your bit of dinner there, "'for it's nothing but right to have a bit of summit hot of a Sunday, "'and not to make it as you can't know your dinner from Saturday.' But now, upon Christmas Day, this blessed Christmas, as is ever coming, if you was to take your dinner to the bakehus, and go to church, and see the holly and the yew, and hear the anthem, and then take the sacrament, you'd be a deal the better, and you'd know which end you stood on, and you could put your trust in them as knows better nor we do, seein' you'd ha' done what it lies on us all to do. Dolly's exhortation, which was an unusually long effort of speech for her, was uttered in the soothing persuasive tone with which she would have tried to prevail on a sick man to take his medicine, or a basin of gruel for which he had no appetite. Silas had never before been closely urged on the point of his absence from church, which had only been thought of as part of his general queerness, and he was too direct and simple to evade Dolly's appeal. "'Nay, nay,' he said, I know nothing at church. I've never been to church. No, said Dolly, in a low tone of wonderment. Then, bethinking herself of Silas's advent from an unknown country, she said, Could it have been as they'd no church where you was born? Oh, yes, said Silas, meditatively, sitting in his usual posture of leaning on his knees and supporting his head. There was churches. A many. It was a big town. "'But I knew nothing of em. I went to chapel.' Dolly was much puzzled at this new word, but she was rather afraid of inquiring further, lest chapel might mean some haunt of wickedness. After a little thought she said, "'Well, Master Marner, it's never too late to turn over a new leaf, and if you've never had no church, there's no telling the good it'll do you, for I feel so set up and comfortable as never was when I've been and heard the prayers.' and the singing to the praise and glory of God, as Mr. Macy gives out, and Mr. Crackenthorpe saying good words, and more particular on sacrament day, and if a bit of trouble comes, I feel as I can put up with it, for I've looked for help in the right quarter, and give myself up to them as we must all give ourselves up to at the last, and if we'n done our part, it isn't to be believed as them as are above us will be worse nor we are, and come short of theirn. Poor Dolly's exposition of her simple Ravelo theology fell rather unmeaningly on Silas's ears, for there is no word in it that could rouse a memory of what he had known as religion, and his comprehension was quite baffled by the plural pronoun, which was no heresy of Dolly's, but only her way of avoiding a presumptuous familiarity. He remained silent, not feeling inclined to assent to the part of Dolly's speech which he fully understood her recommendation that he should go to church. Indeed, Silas was so unaccustomed to talk beyond the brief questions and answers necessary for the transaction of his simple business, that words did not easily come to him without the urgency of a distinct purpose. But now, little Aaron, having become used to the weaver's awful presence, had advanced to his mother's side, and Silas, seeming to notice him for the first time, tried to return Dolly's signs of good will by offering the lad a bit of lard cake. Aaron shrank back a little, and rubbed his head against his mother's shoulder, but still thought the piece of cake worth the risk of putting his hand out for it. "'Oh, for shame, Aaron,' said his mother, taking him on her lap, however. "'Why, you don't want cake again yet a while. He's wonderful hearty,' she went on, with a little sigh. "'That he is, God knows.' He's my youngest, and we spoil him sadly, for either me or the father must always have him in our sight, that we must. She stroked Aaron's brown head, and thought it must do Master Marner good to see such a picture of a child. But Marner, on the other side of the hearth, saw the neat-featured rosy face as a mere dim round, with two dark spots in it. "'And he's got a voice like a bird, you wouldn't think,' Dolly went on. He can sing a Christmas carol as his father's taught him, and I take it for a token he'll come to good, as he can learn the good tunes so quick. Come, Aaron, stand up and sing the carol to Master Marner. Come. Aaron replied by rubbing his forehead against his mother's shoulder. Oh, that's naughty, said Dolly gently. Stand up, when mother tells you, 
and let me hold the cake till you've done. Aaron was not indisposed to display his talents, even to an ogre, under protecting circumstances, and after a few more signs of coyness, consisting chiefly in rubbing the backs of his hands over his eyes, and then peeping between them at Master Marner to see if he looked anxious for the carol, he at length allowed his head to be duly adjusted, and standing behind the table, which let him appear above it only as far as his broad frill, so that he looked like a cherubic head untroubled with a body, he began with a clear chirp, and in a melody that had the rhythm of an industrious hammer. God rest you, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay, for Jesus Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. Dolly listened with a devout look, glancing at Marner in some confidence that this strain would help to allure him to church. That's Christmas music, she said, when Aaron had ended, and had secured his piece of cake again. There's no other music equal to the Christmas music. Ark the herald angels sing, and you may judge what it is at church, Master Marner, with the bassoon and voices, as you can't help thinking you've got to a better place already, for I wouldn't speak ill of this world, seeing as them put us in it as knows best, but what with the drink, and the quarrelling, and the bad illnesses, and the hard dying, as I've seen times and times, once thankful to hear of a better. The boy sings pretty, don't he, Master Marner? Yes said Silas, absently. Very pretty. The Christmas carol, with its hammer-like rhythm, had fallen on his ears as strange music, quite unlike a hymn, and could have none of the effect Dolly contemplated. But he wanted to show her that he was grateful, and the only mode that occurred to him was to offer Aaron a bit more cake. "'Oh, no, thank you, Master Marner,' said Dolly, holding down Aaron's willing hands. "'We must be going home now, and so I wish you good-bye, Master Marner, and if you ever feel any ways bad in your inside, as you can't fend for yourself, I'll come and clean up for you, and get you a bit of victual and willing. But I beg and pray of you to leave off weaving of a Sunday, for it's bad for soul and body, and the money as comes o' that way'll be a bad bed to lie down on at the last, if it doesn't fly away nobody knows where, like the white frost. And you'll excuse me being that free with you, Master Marner, for I wish you well. I do. Make your bow, Aaron. Silas said, Good-bye, and thank you kindly as he opened the door for Dolly, but he couldn't help feeling relieved when she was gone, relieved that he might weave again and moan at his ease. Her simple view of life and its comforts, by which she had tried to cheer him, was only like a report of unknown objects which his imagination could not fashion. The fountains of human love and of faith in a divine love had not yet been unlocked, and his soul was still the shrunken rivulet with only this difference, that its little groove of sand was blocked up, and it wandered confusedly against dark obstruction. And so, notwithstanding the honest persuasions of Mr. Macy and Dolly Winthrop, Silas spent his Christmas day in loneliness, eating his meat in sadness of heart, though the meat had come to him as a neighborly present. In the morning he looked out on the black frost that seemed to press cruelly on every blade of grass, while the half-icy red pool shivered under the bitter wind, but towards evening the snow began to fall, and curtained from him even that dreary outlook, shutting him close up with his narrow grief, and he sat in his robbed home through the livelong evening, not caring to close his shutters or lock his door, pressing his head between his hands and moaning, till the cold grasped him and told him that his fire was grey. Nobody in this world but himself knew that he was the same Silas Marner who had once loved his fellow with tender love, and trusted in an unseen goodness. Even to himself that past experience had become dim. But in Ravelow village the bells rang merrily, and the church was fuller than all through the rest of the year, with red faces among the abundant dark green boughs, faces prepared for a longer service than usual by an odorous breakfast of toast and ale those green boughs, the hymn and anthem never heard but at Christmas, even the Athanasian Creed, which was discriminated from the others only as being longer and of exceptional virtue, since it was only read on rare occasions, brought a vague exulting sense, for which the grown men could as little have found words as the children, that something great and mysterious had been done for them in heaven above and in earth below, which they were appropriating by their presence. 
and then the red faces made their way through the black biting frost to their own homes, feeling themselves free for the rest of the day to eat, drink, and be merry, and using that Christian freedom without diffidence. At Squire Cass's family party that day nobody mentioned Dunstan. Nobody was sorry for his absence, or feared it would be too long. The doctor and his wife, uncle and aunt Kimball, were there, and the annual Christmas talk was carried through without any omissions, rising to the climax of Mr. Kimball's experience when he walked the London hospitals thirty years back, together with striking professional anecdotes then gathered. Whereupon cards followed, with Aunt Kimball's annual failure to follow suit, and Uncle Kimball's irascibility concerning the odd trick which was rarely explicable to him, when it was not on his side, without a general visitation of tricks to see that they were formed on sound principles, the whole being accompanied by a strong steaming odour of spirits and water. But the party on Christmas Day, being a strictly family party, was not the pre-eminently brilliant celebration of the season at the Red House. It was the great dance on New Year's Eve that made the glory of Squire Cass's hospitality, as of his forefathers, time out of mind. This was the occasion when all the society of Ravelow and Tarley, whether old acquaintances separated by long rutty distances, or cooled acquaintances separated by misunderstandings concerning runaway calves, or acquaintances founded on intermittent condescension, counted on meeting, and on comporting themselves with mutual appropriateness. This was the occasion on which fair dames who came on pillions sent their bandboxes before them, supplied with more than their evening costume, for the feast was not to end with a single evening, like a paltry town entertainment, where the whole supply of eatables is put on the table at once, and bedding is scanty. The red house was provisioned as if for a siege, and as for the spare feather-beds ready to be laid on floors, they were as plentiful as might naturally be expected in a family that had killed its own geese for many generations. Godfrey Cass was looking forward to this New Year's Eve with a foolish, reckless longing that made him half deaf to his importunate companion, Anxiety. "'Duncy will be coming home soon. There will be a great blow-up. And how will you bribe his spite to silence?' said Anxiety. "'Oh, he won't come home before New Year's Eve, perhaps,' said Godfrey. "'And I shall sit by Nancy, then, and dance with her, and get a kind look from her in spite of herself.' "'But money is wanted in another quarter,' said Anxiety, in a louder voice. "'And how will you get it, without selling your mother's diamond pin? And if you don't get it—' "'Well, but something may happen to make things easier. At any rate, there's one pleasure for me close at hand. Nancy is coming.' "'Yes, and suppose your father should bring matters to a pass that will oblige you to decline marrying her, and to give your reasons. Hold your tongue, and don't worry me. I can see Nancy's eyes, just as they will look at me, and feel her hand in mine already. But anxiety went on, though in noisy Christmas company, refusing to be utterly quieted even by much drinking. End of chapter 10